You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Welcome to From Beneath the Hollywood Sign. If you love old movies, Hollywood history, or the golden age of filmmaking, you've come to the right place. This is the podcast that talks about amazing stories of Tinseltown from another era and fascinating conversations with writer-producer Steve Kubine and actress-writer Nan McNamara. So Steve, did Ava Gardner and Howard Hughes have a good relationship? Well, they did until he dislocated her jaw. What? Well, don't worry. She hit him back with an ashtray. From Beneath the Hollywood Sign is the gin joint for you. Hello, everyone. Before we get to today's episode, it is with great sadness from us all to share that our friend and listener Mike Cameron has passed away from his fight with cancer. We've been talking about him the past few episodes, and we wanted to inform all of you that his family set up a GoFundMe account where you can donate to help uh, cover the costs of some of his funeral expenses, and that link will be in the show notes. Yeah, Mike was not only a listener and a supporter of our show, but also a friend who we met several times at uh, various events and also a titan in the trivia world. You'll be missed, Mike. Recorded in Chicago, Illinois, with your hosts, Ken, Matt, Neil, and Jeff, this is Triviality. Hello and welcome to Triviality, the game where a lack of seriousness meets a little bit of knowledge. My name is Neil, and we are not in Austin, Texas today, uh, but it is the one-year anniversary of Geek Bowl, uh, where we were in Chicago last year. We had a wonderful time, uh, but I'm stuck with uh, Jeff and Ken here today, so how are you guys? Stuck? Wow. Stuck in the middle with you. It's an an endearing compliment. Well, it's definitely a clown to the left of me, but uh, we've got some lovely guests to the right, so. We do, uh, but let's first introduce our L.A. Uh, Clippers slash Lakers slash I guess Dodgers. I don't know what else you're mm-hmm. supporting now. Matt? Probably the Mighty Ducks. What I'm really their... excited for that new uh, Disney Plus series. What other backstabbing have been doing? No, I root for whoever's winning. That's that's me. I'm an, I'm a bandwagon guy. Man, I know you follow some uh, Chicago Bears beat writers uh, that I'm familiar with, uh, Adam Hogue and Adam Johns. And uh, on their podcast, they posit that uh, Gordon Bombay is trash. So we might have to get you on that show <laughs> to uh, to talk about it. The defend the Minnesota Miracle Man. They said uh, he he never should have ridden that limo on the ice. First of all, and uh, he shouldn't well, be around children. Well, that was a bad idea. Yes. Any anyone I mean, who's been whole... around ice knows you don't drive a car onto it. I mean, the whole thing was revolved around a DUI, right? That is correct. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll have to revisit that later, Matt. We'll have you uh, doing a deep dive. But speaking of deep dives, someone who d- who does them very very well uh, on the topic of music and uh, is about to do one we're super excited about uh, that I'll let her talk about is friend of the show, Jill Hopkins. How are you, Jill? Hey, how are you? Welcome back. Yes. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And I'm, I'm having a, this is like the cap to a really good Chicago day. It is a very good Chicago day. Uh, as we mentioned at the top, uh, last year was Geek Bowl. We uh, had the chance to see you in person. And unfortunately, that was the last time we get to see you in person. So what have you been up to? And what can you tell us about your latest projects? Oh, I uh, I host a radio show here in Chicago on a station called Vocalo. Uh, the show's called Jill Afternoons. I get four hours of radio every day to play awesome music. And I have a podcast called The Opus uh, with Consequence of Sound and Sony Legacy. And I get to do four episodes on a different classic album uh, every month. And it's really fun. It's a lot of work and it's really fun. And this, this uh, season... We're doing the Fuji's The Score for the 25th anniversary of the album, which doesn't make me feel like an ancient Methuselah at all. <laughs> but when are you getting to Tub Thumper? That's what I want to know. <laughs> well, I was going to do it, uh, but then I got knocked down. But, mm. but I got but. up again. <laughs> There's always a but. There is always a but, but ready or not, uh, our host is about to come here. And uh, that is our friend Jeremy Goodson. Uh. How are you, Jeremy? Uh, <laughs> I, I somehow that was that softball was right there and you threw it right at me i got it i'm good how are you guys i'm glad to be here yeah we're glad to have you uh, we always enjoy uh, watching you do uh, i guess i guess you would call it like digital karaoke because you're doing it over streaming which is really cool uh we see you uh there late nights uh you know uh, in charge of all the music but uh, what, else have, what else have you been up to well, actually, it's weird because thanks to the RIAA and their um, 
endless l- threats of lawsuits, Twitch actually shut down the karaoke thing. Um, oh, no. Um, but we, uh, I still do some trivia on stream. I do some, uh, uh, marbles on stream, which is, uh, really caught on uh, and become way more popular than I thought it would be. So that's pretty much our main thing right now. It, it's a really weird, uh, concept to think about, but you're racing marbles or you're battling it out in the marble, uh, battle Royale arena. <laughs> and it sounds so weird saying it out loud, uh, for this, uh, people just chat in the chat box, you know, respond back to them. And then all you have to do is type a command at the beginning of each race to put down a marble and that's it. So there's everybody can play, but there's minimal interaction with the game itself. Mm. So it's mostly a, a really, good. really good chatting time. Well, well, thank you, uh, Jeremy, for joining us. Uh, you wrote today's game uh, and you also have a connection with someone that I think we know in common. Uh, we're not sure if we know of his name, but uh, he has a reputation, I think, right? Yeah, a little bit of a reputation, kind of a douchebag. And it's a lot thing, of his questions you know. are the same way. So we'll we'll shout him out later, maybe. We'll see how we're all feeling. <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much for writing today's game. Jill, thank you for joining us. But before we can play a game, we have to listen to the rules. So let's see what uh, our rules guy's up to. The rules of the game are simple. 20 questions split into two rounds worth 10 points apiece. At halftime, there'll be a special swing round designed by this week's host. After regulation, players will enter the final round with the points that they've accumulated and will have a chance to wager 0 to 30 points on five categorized questions. At the end of the game, someone will be named the cream of the crop. Are you Carly Simon? Because nobody does it better. You're the cream of the crop. That was a pretty good Wyclef Jean impression, but you can't really copy the master. One time. (laughs) We're we're all on fire today. Uh, I'm going to sit out uh, because I actually have to read the liner notes of uh, the score. I have the vinyl in front of me, but Jeff, you and Ken are going to play together. Yeah, we won last time, so let's keep the good times rolling. Uh, What would you like your team name to be? Let's keep the good times rolling. Ooh, I like it. Very simple. <laughs> keep the good times rolling. And uh, Jill and Matt, any ideas on a team name? I think we could be the uh, the Fuji Laws. Let's keep that. Let's keep it going. <laughs> I've always wanted to be Praz, so this is this is perfect for me. Said literally you only. Just. <laughs> <laughs> He's the Ringo of uh, the Fujis. But you know, he's the glue that holds the, holds the whole thing together. Yeah. Yeah. He like, had a really good verse on that Bullworth song, I believe. Who's oh, the, that Ghetto Superstar? That was mm-hmm. dumb. Yeah. Who's the Ringo of Triviality, though? That's the question. We'll let uh, we'll let the listeners decide. We'll throw up a poll. <laughs> yeah. That's the way to do it. <laughs> let but, us know in the comments. Yeah, Don't forget some, to subscribe. Create some intrigue. Um, well, Jeremy, uh, you're going to be holding the glue together with all of us tonight as hosts, so take it away. All right. Well, then I guess we will jump right into round one with question one, if you guys are ready. Yeah. All right. Here's your question. What prolific American writer who won the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1930 and even made a run at becoming governor of California in 1934 had his book Oil, with an exclamation point at the end, used as the inspiration for the film There Will Be Blood? The jury is still out on if Axl Rose harnessed his most well-known work for inspiration. Yeah, I'm thinking uh, Axl Rose, Welcome to the Jungle, Mm -hmm. and The Jungle was written, I want to say, by Upton Sinclair. Okay. I I am okay with that because I have nothing. So (laughs) Upton Sinclair, I think, is the answer we're going with. I think I was awake that day. How how correct you guys are now that we hear it. Um, I said (laughs) uh, Paradise City, Paradise Lost, Milton, I don't know, Milton. (laughs) That's much, much older, I think. Um, yeah, Milton is much, much older. Uh, you were correct about that. But it's a good guess, uh, you know, Paradise City. Uh, but no, what we were looking for was uh, a hint to the jungle there and Upton Sinclair. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. killing me because when, when he said, oh, well, an exclamation point, I thought it was Upton Sinclair. But Portrayed by uh, scientist together. Bill Nye in Mank. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, well, um, Jeff is just uh, the strong, silent type. But I wish he'd be the strong answer giving type today. <laughs> well, at least we he's know really he good at knowing stick. the answer afterwards and not telling you that he <laughs> thought it was the answer the whole time. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> we appreciate it over here. All right. Well, let's go into question number two then. Uh, there is one state in the U.S. that has a largely forested region that is surrounded on three sides by three different Great Lakes and on its other side by a different state. 
By what more common name is this area generally known as? We can lock in. Is this is this the the Uper? Is this the Upper Peninsula? Oh yeah, to say that. Uh, okay. <laughs> we're, going, we're going with the Uper, the Upper Peninsula. Yep, we said the UP, the Upper Peninsula for Michigan. Yep, and I will actually accept either of those, the UP or the Michigan Upper Peninsula. All right. Nice job. Nice. Let's go into question three. Uh, in a 2009 Rolling Stone interview, Metallica drummer Lars Ulrich admitted that he just wanted to try it out and see how it worked. He took a lot of heat for this, as nine years earlier, he'd started a crusade against this exact thing, apparently not knowing anything about it, going as far as testifying before Congress to help push through the passing of the DMCA. What did he do in 2009 to cause this controversy? Not tune his drum. <laughs> Stay on beat. <laughs> Wear long pants. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I got this one. Okay. We can lock in. I trust you. Okay. All right. Is this something about like downloading music? Yeah, it's the Digital Music Act or something yeah. like that. So what did he not do? Or what did he support? Maybe he like backed Napster or Spotify. Or something? No, I think it was way too early for Spotify. Because they, they got Napster shut down like almost single-handedly. I just wanted to try it. <laughs> they, they, in, let's say he invested in Spotify. Oh, okay. I don't know. Can you invested Jill? in Spotify? Oh, I just said that he just downloaded music off the internet because he was so anti and he went on that anti Napster crusade mm -hmm. in the early 2000s. He was real, yeah. real aggro about it. Downloaded the new 303 album, probably. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he just got uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have a judgment call to make here um, because the exact thing he did in 2009 was he wanted to see how illegal music downloading went. So he went and illegally downloaded the new Metallica album mm. <laughs> and then admitted to it in an interview. Oh, which means in, in the interview, he said, uh, you know, I just wanted to try it and see how it worked, which points to the fact that nine years earlier, he hadn't actually done it or ever seen or knew anything about how it worked. Mm -hmm. But he still went on a crusade against it. I um, think that everyone gets points. That's very generous. Everyone. Yeah. We, we all talked about downloading illegally. As generous as an extra downbeat that Lars loves to give us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and once again, this story just proves if you stay the hero long enough to see yourself become the villain. What was that? What was that? Yeah, I don't that's know. how it goes. Something about Batman? I, I don't know. <laughs> all right. Let's go to question number four. What popular television series, which ran for six seasons from 2010 to 2015, follows the Crawley family and their servants as they deal with life after the sinking of the Titanic, which is the catalyst that sets the show's events in motion? Why does this not sound familiar at all? Well, that's How did it last six seasons? I don't know what it is. I know exactly what it is. Oh, are we locked in? We're locked, locked in. Jill's in. On, Jill's on fire. I'm I'm out. <laughs> I was so nervous, you guys. This is I'm. I can just I can die after this. <laughs> what is this? Just Downton Abbey. Is it? Is it? I don't. That's know. about the right time. Okay. It's a good guess. Right about six seasons. That's about the right time frame. Okay. The plot sounded funnier than that, though. But <laughs> <laughs> let's say Downton Abbey. Okay, you guys said Downton Abbey. Uh, we chill and Matt. Said, we also said Downton Abbey. And you are also correct. Both teams getting points. Okay. Who sang okay. that song, uh, Mr. Crowley? You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> no. Oh. Not, <laughs> Not at all. Black Sabbath. Black Sabbath. <laughs> Black Sabbath. Yeah, there it is. That should have been the theme song. It's Ozzy been. Osbourne. There you go. Okay. <laughs> all right, well, let's go into question number five. While it sounded more evil than it actually is, or is it? If you are said to be Sinistro Manual, what does that mean about you? Okay, we are going to go ahead and lock in. Does it mean that you can't use your hands or that you're ambidextrous? <laughs> it's going to be like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, sinistro Manual. I've, that does not sound familiar to me. Well, so. it's, 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 I'm, I think it might be something about hands if it's manual. Okay. Like, but I don't, let's just Ambi, say. Ambidextrous sounds good. I like yeah, that. I'm fine with that. Let's do that. All right. I think uh, Ned Flanders is uh, Sinistro Manual. 
Uh, we're saying uh, left-handed. Uh, I'm Sinister Manual. <laughs> um, you are Sinister Manual because uh, if you're left-handed, that is the uh, Latin term the for devil. it. Yeah. Do they really try to get you to not be left-handed when you're a child? Um, so they they showed me they gave me this pencil holder thing that was supposed to teach me how to write right-handed, and I I refused. I said no. It's because you're smearing ink all over the place. <laughs> your don't, don't try to change me, baby. That's what I said <laughs> to my kindergarten teacher. <laughs> did you see and then it? he did finger guns at her. <laughs> did, you, pew, pew, did you see pew. it like Kawhi Leonard, Matt, too? <laughs> I said, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> oh, whatever he did then. Uh, well, after uh, five questions, it looks like it's all tied up at 40 points. All right, perfect. Let's go into question number six then and see if we can uh, make some distance. Donnie, Danny, Joey, Johnny, and Jordan may have had an idea spark after reading what 1979 nonfiction bestseller written by Tom Wolfe that documents the stories of the first Project Mercury astronauts selected for the NASA space program. I, I think we can lock in here. Okay. <laughs> Trust me, I'm a 41-year-old woman. No, I, I mean... I know the answer to this question. <laughs> I know those boys, but I don't know the book, so I'm glad that Jill's on my team. <laughs> the right stuff. The right stuff is the book, I think. Well, that's what we're looking for, right? Yeah, I guess. I don't I don't know what the Donnie, Danny, Jordan, <laughs> all those people. We're gonna say the right stuff. Okay, you're locked in with the right stuff. And we are Matt locked in Jill. with uh with the right stuff. All yeah. right. Yeah. Donnie Danny Joey, Johnny, and Jordan are the new kids on the block oh. with their hit song, The Right Stuff, mm. which is also the name of the book. So nicely Neil done. Neil is actually doing the uh, the new kids dance in the studio right now. It's all trying to together. say anything. Surprisingly good. <laughs> <laughs> that back tattoo can really move. <laughs> or can it? Or can it's it? Real. It's true. It depends, uh, you know, how many steps are in front of it, basically. <laughs> We did <laughs> confirm or deny the existence of the tattoo to some of our guests, but they were sworn to secrecy. So we did. Yeah, I guess if you if you're a guest on the show, you can request to <laughs> know the actual answer, but you have to be you have to sign an NDA. Yeah, it's I will do that back right tattoo. Now. <laughs> <laughs> it is Schrodinger's back tattoo. All right, let's go into question number seven. Filmed on a budget of $87,000 and bringing in over $3 million at the box office, what was the name of the 1972 directorial debut film from Wes Craven that also spawned a remake with the same name in 2009? Weren't you talking mm. about this film recently? I never see these movies because I have bad dreams. <laughs> I, think, I think we're going to go ahead and lock in here. I know you absolutely hate this film. Yeah, I, I found it in bad taste. And I have the worst taste. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a it's an old horror movie that was turned into a new horror movie but that's like every horror movie now. i know it, it's not house on haunting on haunted hill it's something like that was rob zombie making stuff in 2009 yeah Music. haunted houses in villa park um, <laughs> i forgot about that <laughs> music too <laughs> Did he do the Texas Chainsaw Massacre? He did. I think he did a Texas Chainsaw Massacre. A uh, Wes Craven. I don't know if Wes Craven did. I think the that remake is earlier than two thousand nine. I think. I think this might be the last house on the left. Uh, I, I think that came out that year. Uh, um, I don't remember it, it being good, and I don't think Ken would like it. <laughs> so for all those reasons, I think that's that's for, an for answer. For those reasons, I'm out. <laughs> yeah. You want to lock in with that? Yeah, go for it. All right. Last house on the left. Yes, we also said last house on the left. That was magic watching Matt just pull that out of nowhere, Red by the way. Reservoir of genius. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it is the last house on the left. That's Wes Craven's very first movie. He wrote and directed it. It's the uh, Sinestro mm. Manual of Horror Films. Yeah, I guess so. All right, uh, you didn't hear an edit here, but we actually just watched the entirety of Last House on the left before we're continuing with the next question. So we're all uh, feel a little dirty. Uh, so, Jeremy, just, mm -hmm. just get us out of here, please. It's a all whole right. mood. Change the topic completely here. Question number eight. Starting in late elementary school and going through college, you probably had the Pythagorean theorem etched into your brain more than once. Let's see if you remember why. 
What is the Pythagorean theorem used to find, assuming you're solving it as written? Yeah, we can lock in. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the area of a triangle? Is, it, is that right? right? G squared, B squared, C squared? A right? squared plus B squared equals C this guy? squared. If it's squared, that's two dimensions, so that would be a volume or uh, area, right? That makes sense, doesn't yeah. it? Let's say that. I like it. Okay. All right. Math. Area of a triangle. Yeah, I believe, so the formula is A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And I believe that that is supposed to represent the lengths of the sides of a right triangle, C being the hypotenuse. Okay. So, yeah, you guys said the area of the right triangle, and you guys are saying the hypotenuse of the right triangle. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, it is the hypotenuse of a right, mm -hmm. right triangle. So, yes, hypotenuse of a right triangle is what we're looking for in that one. All right, let's go into question number nine then. And it is this. The show The A-Team, which ran from 1983 to 1987, followed the exploits of a fictitious former United States Army Special Forces unit that escaped from prison after being found guilty of a crime they didn't commit. The members of this group consisted of Colonel John Hannibal Smith, Lieutenant Templeton Faceman Peck, Captain H.M. Howling Mad Murdoch, and what other character portrayed famously by Mr. T? And I'll accept his nickname on the show if you don't know the full name. Yeah, we're locked in. I think I can lock in as well. Or can you? Do you know? Do you know? Do you remember the show? It's, uh, is this B.A. Baracus? Was that his name? Something like yeah. that? Bad Attitude Baracus, I think. Yeah. BA. He had a bad attitude. That makes sense. And a fear of flying, if I remember. <laughs> they had to, like, drug him or something before they put him on helicopters. <laughs> bad altitude Baracus. <laughs> <laughs> we too said B.A. Baracus. All right. And both uh, teams are getting correct for Sergeant Bosco B.A. or Bad Attitude Baracus. Bosco. <laughs> uh, heir to a large uh, mozzarella empire, mozzarella stick empire. I love me some Bosco, Bosco sticks. sticks. That's... See, we almost said B.A. Barabbas, and that's the guy from the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, then let's go into question number 10 to close out round number one. So if you were paying attention during this round, you may have noticed a theme and will have an easier time telling me the name of the 2003 Black Eyed Peas song that won the Grammy for Best Rap Performance by a Duo or Group. What's the song? Probably should have wrote our answers down. <laughs> oh, this is, that's wild. <laughs> Do you know? I have no idea. Is that the name of the song? Oh, I don't know if that's the name of the song. Let's but... just go with it, because I, I don't want to... If that's wrong, I don't want to answer a Black Eyed Peas question correctly. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I think this is... Uh, this might have been the first Fergie Black Eyed Peas album. And I think I think this is the one with Where Is The Love On It, and those are directions, so it's like up, down, left, or right. You're wondering where the love is. Does that make sense? Yes, but... Mm -hmm. Is that also the cheat code from, it's like up, up, down, oh, down. Oh, the Konami up. code? Yeah. They have a song called uh, the Konami code? I don't know. Contra? <laughs> Is Contra the name? That, I mean, that. They, they have a song called Ninja like Gaiden? <laughs> they all sound like pop songs. I don't know. <laughs> well, up, up, down, down, left, right. And then B-A- Wow, man, that is the Konami code. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I don't know a name of the Black Eyed Peas song, though. I mean, cheat code sounds like it could be a song about like, oh, you cheated, and now here's my code for getting. Yeah, let's let's say <laughs> let's say it was cheat code, and hope that that's the name of the song. Locked in. Konami feels like they'd have to pay. <laughs> As I song. said, if if I'm wrong, I don't want to be right, and we said Konami code. So we have Konami code and cheat code. Um, well, if you know the Konami code, you did figure out the theme. There was one button press missing, and that button press was start. Mm. So let's get it started. Oh, my oh. God. Song by the Black Eyed Peas. <laughs> oh, my favorite part of Hot Tub Time Machine. Oh, that was a good part of Hot Tub Time Machine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you agreed. <laughs> After the first round, it looks like Fuji Laws have 70 points, but in the lead are keeping the good times rolling with 80. All right, so that brings us into the swing round. 
And uh, I have a I have an interesting one for you today. We're going to go with a uh, Liquid Courage staple here with anybody who's been to one of our shows has seen at least one of these questions every show. And that is explain a film plot badly. But little twist. This is going to be explain a comic book film plot badly. OK. I'm going to give you 10 really bad descriptions of uh, comic book movies, and I need to know the movie. OK. All right. So number one, Sherlock Holmes spends a lot of time working on himself while recovering from an accident. He teams up with Lucius Lyon and Viola de Lesseps to stop Father Daniel Flynn from starting the next for-profit global war. Question two. Tyler Durden beefs up on some weird steroids and finds himself to have some performance issues when finally getting some time alone with Arwen. Question three. In the Alaskan wilderness, Danny Walker and Cleo Miller attempt to prevent Colonel William Stryker and his invading band of miscreants from drinking the town dry. Question four. After knocking up his best friend, the title character dates Captain Marvel for a bit, then gets into fights with Superman and Captain America. Question five. Denny Duquette apparently tells jokes, possibly about a Timex, and the anatomy of the world's largest mammal. Question six. Fresh off of winning the inaugural AAGPBL championship, Kit Keller teams with Rachel Keller, no relation, to take on Alex DeLarge, making friends with Finn Tutuola and the owner of the Washington, D.C. rib joint frequented by a South Carolina politician along the way. Question number seven. Paranoid billionaire is afraid of an immigrant until he realizes their mothers share a name and then they become besties. Uh, Question eight. Single geologist father tries his best to end the ever-growing economic collapse that is sure to befall society, while his green-thumbed daughter and her good but slightly douchey friends try a different approach. Question nine. Ben Turner suffers betrayal at the hands of President Bartlett and strikes a deal with Fred and Scooby to see his beloved one last time, all while being guided and tormented by Luigi Mario. Question 10. Conan the Barbarian goes on a voyage for cutlery. All right, we will think about these answers. We'll be right back. Okay, all the answers have been locked in, and since this round is all about superhero or comic book movies, uh, they all consist of a lot of team-ups. And with the Snyder Cut uh, coming very close, uh, I think it's March 18th, that movie is about a team-up. It's the Justice League, and uh, we wouldn't be able to do our show without our team, which consists of you, our Patreon supporters. So if you'd like to join all of the Patreon supporters that help support our show and continue to keep us growing, build things like the Batwing and... Fortress of Solitude and all that good stuff. Uh, you can go to patreon.com slash triviality podcast, get a lot of great perks, tons and tons of extra audio content. And uh, if you play your cards right, if we can pass 400 or maybe even 500 patrons, we might do a calendar where we dress up in tights just like your favorite superheroes. So please go to patreon.com slash triviality podcast, help support the show. And Jeremy, uh, take it away and let's hear these questions one more time. All right. So let's uh, start from the top here and see what you guys came up with. Uh, Question one, Sherlock Holmes spends a lot of time working on himself while recovering from an accident. He teams up with Lucius Lyon and Viola de Lesseps to stop Father Daniel Flynn from starting the next for-profit global war. All right. We think this was an attempted mislead to try to get us to say Doctor Strange, but we said Iron Man. Mm, See, I thought it was Iron Man, and then Jill almost made me think it was Doctor Strange, but I had forgotten that Cumberbatch played Sherlock. Uh, We said Iron Man. Both teams saying Iron Man and both teams getting credit. It is Iron Man. Ooh, it was the Lucius Lion that helped. I forgot that they swapped out roadies. Yep. Yep. Um, all right. Question number two. Tyler Durden beefs up on some weird steroids and finds himself to have some performance issues when finally getting some time alone with Arwen. Uh, we said this is the oft forgot Incredible Hulk. We also went with the Incredible Hulk. Uh, the the Incredible Hulk it is. Uh, I was hoping that maybe uh, somebody would say Deadpool 2 because of Brad Pitt, but uh, you both mm-hmm. pulled the right Tyler Durden. All right, going into question number three. In the Alaskan wilderness, Danny Walker and Cleo Miller attempt to prevent Colonel William Stryker and his invading band of miscreants from drinking the town dry. Yeah, we pretty much knew what this was, but me and Jeff had trouble... Um nailing down the title of it because Josh Hartnett was also in 40 Days and 40 Nights, which is when he couldn't suck blood for 40 Days and 40 Nights. Um, But we said this was 30 Days of Night. 
Oh, man, I said that name, and I didn't think it was a comic book thing. Uh, we thought it was some kind of vampire, so we just locked in with Blade. Yeah, you did get the uh, the clue about the drinking the town dry not being uh, actual alcohol, but being blood. And, uh, Matt, you did say it. It is 30 days of night. It's all right. All right. <laughs> I, I can't count. I mean, I, I can't even count how many times I've done that where I've talked myself out of an answer to. Yeah. All right, going into question number four. After knocking up his best friend, the title character dates Captain Marvel for a bit and gets into fights with Superman and Captain America. You once were vegan. Now you will be mm. gone. It's uh, Scott Pilgrim versus the world. Great, great movie. One of my favorites. Mm. Yeah, we thought this question four was a little more fantastic than that. And we said fantastic four. <laughs> yeah, uh, the uh, the first part there being a nod to Juno and Michael Sarah. Uh, to point you towards uh, Scott Pilgrim versus the world. All right, question five. Denny Duquette apparently tells jokes, possibly about a Timex and the anatomy of the world's largest mammal. I was thinking, Denny Duquette. Now that sounds so familiar. What is that from? And then I realized it's from Grey's Anatomy, and it's that guy who plays the comedian in Watchmen. <laughs> oh! We were just guessing. We said Watchmen. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, Denny Duquette or Jeffrey Dean Morgan uh, plays the comedian in Watchmen. And uh, the last part there, just the fact that Dr. Manhattan is giant blue and walking around naked with parts swinging all the time. Does he still have hair, though? Is he still a mammal? We don't know. <laughs> Doesn't have hair. Can't right. make milk. <laughs> I have nipples, Greg. Can you milk me? <laughs> all right, go to question six. Fresh off of winning the inaugural AAGPBL championship, Kit Keller teams with Rachel Keller, no relation, to take on Alex DeLarge, making friends with Finn Tutuola and the owner of a Washington, D.C. rib joint frequented by a South Carolina politician along the way. All right. We figured out a lot of the actors here. You said the uh, the rib joint owner was... I believe that's Reggie Caffey. And I said... Uh... Kit Keller is probably Gina Davis from League of Their Own, maybe one of the other girls, and Alex DeLarge is Malcolm McDowell, but we still could not put this one together. Tap. You don't know that Ice-T is Finn Tutuola? Nope. Uh, from SVU? Uh, I do not Jill, watch you that. you this one? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think Kit Keller was Lori Petty in A League of Their Own, so we guessed Tank Girl. Mm. And you guessed correctly. It is Tank Girl. Good one. Good pull. All right, going into question number seven. Paranoid billionaire is afraid of an immigrant until he realizes their mothers share a name. Then they become besties. We said Batman versus Superman. Mm -hmm. The uh, famous Martha. How do you know that name? Uh, I believe Batman versus Superman. I don't need you to be more specific. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> that is absolutely correct. Batman versus Superman, Dawn of Justice, but I'm, just, I'm not going to be that nitpicky. <laughs> you know... <laughs> That movie gets a lot of guff, but I thought the extended one was okay. Not, not amazing. I did not, but, but I did not okay. hate that movie. Yeah. I did not hate that movie. I think it was just slower and really, really dark, and people mm -hmm. just... That it, it was. was. You know, that's not what they expected. Yeah. And also, I hate Jesse Eisenberg, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go into question number eight, then. Single geologist father tries his best to end the ever-growing economic collapse that is sure to befall society while his green-thumbed daughter and her good but slightly douchey friends try a different approach. So we thought this could apply pretty well to Guardians of the Galaxy or Infinity War, um, and we just chose to go with Guardians of the Galaxy because it makes more sense with the friends part. Matt was really good at saying ge a geologist could be the person who's looking for stones. And it was Thanos, and we guessed Guardians of the Galaxy. Unfortunately, I can't give credit for that, because you are not wrong that the Guardians of the Galaxy are involved, but Thanos is not a part of either of those movies in any major mm, way that whatsoever. That is false. Well, was it, oh, was it? Oh. Thanos he is, is in definitely fact, in those movies. Uh, as a cameo, like at the end. Uh, what we're looking for, though, was Avengers. Either, I would have ex ex uh, taken either Infinity War or Endgame. I, dis I dispute <laughs> but since since we both don't get points, I guess it doesn't matter. I'll let it go. Good day, sir. Yeah, but Thanos isn't in the movie. He is until in the like, movie. Um, 
Actually, um, these guys. <laughs> maybe get I out haven't here. seen. It. Okay, you know, maybe I haven't. I mean, it's been a while since no, I've seen. No, it. no, no. Thanos in the movie, like until the very end, like during the end credit scene. Let's talk about more mainstream movies. All like right. Spawn. Let's get to the next one. <laughs> <laughs> Spoilers. <laughs> Going into question number nine. Ben Turner suffers betrayal at the hands of President Bartlett and strikes a deal with Fred and Scooby to see his beloved one last time, all while being guided and tormented by Luigi Mario. All I had to know was uh, John Leguizamo's in this, and I said, <laughs> it's Spawn. Hey, that's exactly how I knew that this was Spawn. <laughs> yes, Spawn. Both teams getting credit. Going into question number 10, then. Conan the Barbarian goes on a voyage for cutlery. Yeah, this is very simple, and we just could not figure it out. Yeah, this is hard. Uh, you know, Jill said Conan thinking Schwarzenegger, and it kind of got us on Schwarzenegger, but there was the remake starring Jason Momoa, who was looking for the trident, which would be cutlery mm. in Aquaman. Uh, yeah, that is absolutely right. It is Aquaman, Jason Momoa playing Conan the Barbarian in the latest movie. I forgot about the existence of that film. <laughs> After the swing round, both teams picking up 35 points, which is a respectable score, uh, bringing the total scores up to 105 for the Fuji Laws and 115 for Keep the Good Times Rolling. Uh, round number two, question one. Though being the namesake for one of the major airports in the city he was mayor of, what leisurely activity did Fiorello LaGuardia ban from the 1940s until 1976? Saying that it robbed school children of their hard earned nickels and dimes. Okay. Um, Jill, what were we thinking on this one? Oh, uh, we were thinking about the time period and New York and what was off and popping back then. And the kids were really into pinball, but I don't think they could play pinball. We yeah. said pinball. We also said uh, they sure could play a mean pinball. <laughs> they could not. They could not play a mean pinball. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's absolutely correct. They could not, from the 1940s until 1976, play pinball in New York City as it was banned by Mayor LaGuardia. Man, and I thought I was a real buzzkill. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go into question number two. Guys named Steve, Andy, and Mick and their sugary-sounding band were inspired to write what hit song after an incident on January 27th, 1973, when the band was performing at the Grand Hall in Kilmarnock, Scotland, and were driven off stage by a bottling. All right, there's a lot of hints in this uh, question. We got uh, band members. We got uh, sweet sounding name, 1973, but uh, it's too sweet for our uh, our action here. So we we just don't know. Oh my gosh, you're gonna hate yourself. The band is the Sweet, and they're called the Sweet, and the song is Ballroom Blitz. Oh yeah. Are you ready, Steve? Andy? Hey, Mick, let's go. Mm. It is a ballroom blitz by the band Sweet. Gotcha. Makes sense now. So sugary sounding band name. And you kept saying sweet sounding. I'm like, oh, you're, you're either going to get it or you're not. <laughs> yeah. I definitely did not know the name of that band. So mm -hmm. I think it was always labeled as the Ramones on Napster. So that's probably what I thought. <laughs> <of>. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> But yeah, good pull, Ballroom Blitz. Uh, and that's the actual true story of the song. A Ballroom Blitz broke out in this hall and inspired them to write the song. <laughs> All right, let's go into question number three. What professional wrestling promoter and advocate to heels everywhere would you find as the, t as the titular role of English announcer in the cinematic gold that was the 2002 movie Rollerball? Yes, you heard me right. The amazing 2002 version, not that 1975 crap from James Caan. Hmm. You should know his name, and he's not afraid to say it every time he introduces himself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We can. Hey, I know one. We can lock in. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! So this is wrestling. Yeah, yeah, wrestling. This is wrestling. Can't place who was in Rollerball. Roller so, Ric Flair. I don't know. Yeah, Ric Flair. Would be, you know, he probably would have been good in that role too. But uh, if he's an advocate for heels, I'm guessing that this is Paul Heyman. My name is Paul Heyman. Yes, Paul Heyman is correct. He is not afraid to say his name every time he picks up a mic. Yeah, if you're not a wrestling fan, you will not know that. <laughs> yeah, and the 2002, as you said, uh, yeah, it was 2002 Rollerball, completely ruined the life and career of director John McTiernan, who was known for things like Die Hard, and then ended up in prison after this movie because he hired people to spy on the studio. 
and the studio execs <laughs> because he thought they were trying to tank him. Like he was paranoid. And uh, yeah, it's a really interesting story. I'd say look it up. It is really long. And but yeah, th- this movie was awful. And the 1975 James Conn movie was fantastic. Um, it can't be that bad. It has a three percent on Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But all right, let's move on to question four. And a shout out to my uh, good buddy Aaron Myers on this one. Invented in 1946, what technological innovation was originally used as a way to pinpoint future positions of airplanes and was later adapted to intercept incoming missiles, but is now relegated to a secondary option for domestic computing? We have absolutely no idea on this one, so I think we're just going to leave it up to you guys. Yeah, I don't. I, I have no idea. So we also don't know. So you, what do you want to say? I'm just going to say Roomba because it would be hilarious if it was true. Yeah, Roomba it is. Um, So we have a tap and a Roomba. Yeah, (laughs) we're really good at this one. (laughs) Um, So there was a little play on words here. Um, Has anybody ever played the arcade cabinet of Missile Command? Mm. No. Yes. What is the controls? uh, It's a ball. It's a trackball. (laughs) Oh. Like from a it's mouse? A trackball. Yeah, it's a trackball mouse. Oh, okay. Oh. Oh, yeah. oh, that's just a laser. Yep. I thought that's <laughs> not it's not fun anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go into question number five. Innovated by Kevin Sheedy, the method of punching a ball held on an outstretched palm to a teammate is known as a handball. One of two primary ways of passing the ball in what nationally named sport? Be careful to avoid any falcons. Nationally named? So yeah. It's the name of a place? How do you play high lie? There's the little hooky thing. Oh, you know what? I you know what this probably is is uh, this could be Australian rules football because um, uh, oh. you can either you can either like punch it like a rugby thing or I think you can kick it. Uh, I think those are the ways that you can move the ball. Um, having played. Or having watched one time with Neil on a very tiny television, I almost was able to figure out what was going on. Um, I think I think we can lock in with that one. Yep, we two said Australian rules football. Yep, and both teams getting credit is the Australian rules football. Uh, and the the kind of joke at the end there was to uh, maybe throw you off, but a falcon in Australian rules football is a ball flying towards your face. Oh. Let's go Carlton Blues, right? <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Let's go Swans. And City Swans. Honk, 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 honk. <laughs> honk. None of, none of those things are right, but uh, what I do have <laughs> right in front of me are uh, the scores. And uh, team Keep the Good Times Rolling at 135, and team Fujilaz right in front of them with 145. Lost some I ground with there, as, Ken. With as many Australian listeners as we have, I'm sure we want to cover as many teams as possible. <laughs> We can talk about all, all right. the teams, but we just got to, I don't know about the Swans ba- battle cries of <laughs> honk, honk, honk. <laughs> I'm assuming the Brisbane Lions, uh, they just play Roar by Katy Perry. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Adelaide Crows play Counting Crows. Yep. Port Adelaide Power plays uh, Metal. Metal. Yeah. Power Metal. We can keep going, but I won't bore the listeners. We won't, yeah, because we <laughs> ran out of them. Okay. Number six. <laughs> all right. Going into question number six. Known as the rule breakers of chemistry, what strange molecular objects are made of 60 carbon atoms fused together in a soccer ball shape? For years, scientists assumed they could only be made in a lab until astronomers found them bopping around in deep space in 2010. James Buchanan Barnes might be impressed. Yeah, we're locked in. I I got this one. I did a report on it in the ninth grade. Wow. (laughs) And you remember it. That I don't remember anything from ninth grade, so this is impressive. What is the answer? Well, I think it's the Buckyball. Mm. Yeah, Buckminster Fuller, I believe, is the namesake for that. We said the Buckyball. The Carbon 60 Adam. Yep, the Carbon 60 Adam, better known as the Buckyball. Mm-hmm. Good job. News to me. All right, going to question number seven. Known for a $495 pair of ugly sneakers sporting apparel, and at one point, water imported from Lithuania. What company was founded in 2016 by Alan Foster and three brothers, two of which play in the NBA? Their controversial (laughs) father, who once claimed he could beat Michael Jordan in a one-on-one game, is also listed as a founder on their Wikipedia entry. Hmm. The Rookie of the Year. Even if this is in the future, he's probably been named Rookie of the Year. We can lock in. Is this a big baller brand, Ken? 
if that's the ball brand. <laughs> you know, the brand of the balls. Right. The ball family. <laughs> yes. I think that's Stay jockey. in your lane. <laughs> All right. What what you said. Yeah. Yeah, no medium ballers here. It's a big baller brand. Yeah, both teams coming up with the right answer. That is the big baller brand. How accurate I, is Keenan Thompson's? Oh, it's so good. Of Lavar, it's really, it's really close. <laughs> the crazy thing is, Lavar is like nuts, but he was right. Like he raised three kids, and two of them made into the NBA. Like that's crazy. And he said that they would do it when they were like twelve, thirteen, fifteen, or whatever it was. So. You know, he knows he knows how to raise NBA kids. That's his specialty. What if they just wanted to play chess or something? Sorry, nope. NBA or nothing. That's why Lagello, Lagello, I think's his name. He's out. They moved. They kicked him out of the country. He's in Lithuania right now. <laughs> no, I, well, I think it's some of the water they were importing. <laughs> Jill just wants to see big baller gambit. Is what she wants to see. Chess, <laughs> basketball, pills, pills. Yeah, <laughs> hallucinations. Mostly pills. pills. Mostly pills. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move into question number eight. This is kind of a throwback. If you remember the last time I hosted Triviality, you might remember me mentioning an actor that once was arrested for claiming he thought he was at home when he was actually in a closed bank and armed. This actor played Patches in the comedy movie Dodgeball alongside Vince Vaughn's Peter and Alan Tudyk's Steve the Pirate. Who was it that played Patches? We're locked in. Dodge, duck, dip, dive, and dodge. <laughs> Patches O'Houlihan. Yeah, I guess two <laughs> actors <laughs> played Patches O'Houlihan. <laughs> he had young Patches and old Patches. I was looking for the one that uh, said he was at home when he was clearly trying to rob a bank. Yeah, we know uh, which that's one the it is. <laughs> the before time. Only patches. one of these Patches would, would do this. <sighs> he's like, I think he's like a really famous character actor, and I can't. I don't think I'm going to come up with his name. I was not sober when I saw the movie Dodgeball. I do not know. I don't think I was either. I Any of the viewings. Made it. <laughs> Matt's, Matt's letterboxed account is just, I was too drunk. I'll just give it three stars and hope for the best. <laughs> this this was the uh, the height of the Redbox era, so I think I probably paid several dollars for this multiple times. And then he forgot it under his bed, and now he owns it. Now it's fifteen dollars. <laughs> paid thirty five dollars for a movie that wasn't worth that. I did pay that much for twenty twelve. Who's a who's a crazy old white guy? There's lots of them. I know. Is it a Baldwin? Is it Billy? Is it a Billy? <laughs> <laughs> Is it a Billy Baldwin? Billy's got his <laughs> together. Give him a break. Steven, if anybody would be Stephen, who's oh, that's true. Hank Robin. Um. I can like picture his face, but like I said, I don't, I don't think I know his name. I, I I hate that I don't know who tried to rob a bank. That's the yeah. kind of info I I crave. Yeah, old man Jenkins. I don't know. Don't know. Gary Busey was was he in jail for something? <laughs> sure. You know what? If it's not Gary Busey, it might as well have been Gary Busey. <laughs> We're locked in. If I'm not mistaken, Ken. This is a man with a very redundant name, right? Yes, Rip Torn. Oh, that's right. Are you serious? <laughs> yeah, it is absolutely uh, Rip Torn. He tried to rob a bank. No, he no, thought he, he was at home. He was things. just hammered. <laughs> 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 I mean, like, I feel like every week one of my friends is telling me that happened to them. <laughs> and every you week it's bad. many friends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we can move on. All right, let's go on to question nine. Speaking of movies, in what 1998 comedy directed by David Zucker would you find cameos by Dale Earnhardt Jr., Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Greg Grunberg, and possibly the greatest ska band of all time, Real Big Fish? Pretty sure I know the movie that Real Big Fish is in, so we're going to look in. This was not Rat Race because that was... 2002. And I think that was Smash Mouth that was in that movie. Was that the mighty Bostones were in Clueless. Okay, we're getting farther away. You know, with all of these cameos, how did Scott not take off? <laughs> it did for a minute, and then landed hard. <laughs> uh, and then so they tried was... to pick it up, pick it up, and it just didn't work. <laughs> all the way through the fourth wave. So, yeah, that's the impression that I get. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> this is this isn't like Talladega Nights, right? 
I was thinking Talladega Nights. Greg Cronberg is the guy uh, from Heroes. He was the cop on Heroes. Wow. I think we should lock it with Talladega Nights. I, I, let's go for it. <laughs> locked in. All right, locked in with Talladega Nights. Pretty How sure, about you guys? Pretty sure the movie with real big fish in it is Basketball. Oh, no. Required, mm. required knowledge for an ex-ska band drummer. It is Basketball. All right, let's go to question number 10, then. There are currently six teams competing in quite possibly the greatest sport of all time. Fans of the brothers from question seven might enjoy this if they like that sport mixed with trampolines. What sport am I talking about? <laughs> oh, it's got a needle Jason even when he's not here. <laughs> we can lock in. It's a stupid game. Yeah. <laughs> trying to remember what exactly it was called. Slam ball. Oh, slam ball. That's it. Slam the ball. answer is slam ball. <laughs> the answer is slam ball it's so always the, slam ball if uh you you might have had an easier time on uh number nine if you realize every single question in this round is about balls <laughs> yep at the end of regulation uh the keep the good times rolling team uh, was batting perfect in the second half of that round uh so their score is 185 and they took the lead over the fuji laws who have 175 points wow it's punch for punch. <laughs> oh my god, we just heard about balls and now we're gonna have fists. Left, right, up, down, Konami. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so your categories for this week's final round are as follows Earth, Fire, Wind, mm -mm. Water. Don't do it. And heart. What did I say about Captain Planet questions? <laughs> all right. All the wagers are locked in. Um, it's time to go big or go home. It looks like uh, the Fujilas are going big, and we are going home. They are going 30 all the way down, and we are taking 15s all the way down. All right, then. Question number one in the category of Earth. Earth 2.0 was discovered by NASA on July 23rd, 2015, approximately 1,400 light years away from Earth in the constellation of Cygnus. Named in part for the space telescope that captured it, what is its official designation given by NASA? In the category of fire, in its over 20-year existence, Chicago Fire FC has won the MLS Cup once and what other award twice given to the worst team in the league? Question number three in the category of wind. Slayer may not be involved, but blood rain is a meteorological occurrence in southern Italy caused by what seasonal wind picking up sand from the Sahel and mixing it with moisture from the Mediterranean Sea? I need the name of the seasonal wind, which sounds similar to a popular hot sauce. Question four in the category of water. In the original Super Mario Brothers video game for the NES, there was a glitch in level 1-2 that allowed you to clip through the final exit pipe if you jumped correctly and got pulled through the wall to the warp pipes. If you entered one of these pipes after performing the glitch, you'd be taken to an endless underwater level. What is this level or world better known as? And for clarification, I'm looking for the number designation of this world. All right, question five in the category of heart. The band Heart was formed in 1970 in Seattle, Washington. They weren't always known by that name, though. They were originally the Army and then White Heart before dropping the white. At one point after Ann Wilson joined the band, they changed their name to What, which might be confused with a 1993 Disney live action flick about the Sanderson sisters. All right, we are going to consider these answers and we'll be right back. All the answers are now locked in. So let's see how we did. Probably not too good. Jeremy, <laughs> I blame you. All right. Yeah, that's fine. I'll take it. All right. Uh, question one in the category of Earth. Earth 2.0 was discovered by NASA on July 23rd, 2015, approximately 1,400 light years away from Earth in the constellation of Cygnus. Named in part for the space telescope that captured it, what is its official designation given by NASA? So we know that they named the planets um, Kepler uh, after the telescope. So it's usually K dash number, and we can't remember the number. So we just guessed uh, Kepler 26. 
Yeah, uh, we also knew that it was the Kepler telescope. Um, Jill said, hey, it's 1,400 light years away. Maybe it's the Kepler 1,400. Uh, both teams doing a real good job of uh, pulling Kepler. Uh, that is absolutely how it starts. Uh, it's Kepler 452B. Of course. So easy. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. 452B. This is probably the hardest forget? one in the list, I would think. Maybe. Um, but it, there was a big article about it again this week um, after the whole Mars rover and everything. People were talking about how do we get to this? And it, there was a big article um, and uh, something that was released by NASA about it again. So I, I felt it was relevant. NASA released a, a mini series called The Bee in Apartment 425B. So maybe that's what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's the one. Uh... All right. Question two in the category of fire. In its over 20-year existence, Chicago Fire FC has won the MLS Cup once and what other award twice given to the worst team in the league? The kicky. <laughs> For what we presume yeah. is negative 15 points. Yeah, I, I don't know if he said it, but we'll be losing 30 points on all these questions. And we said uh, the golden toilet brush. <laughs> um, well, Matt, a little bit closer than the kicky. <laughs> uh, it's the MLS wooden spoon. Wow. Oh. That's nice and useful. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Going into question three in the category of wind. Slayer may not be involved, but blood rain is a meteorological occurrence in southern Italy caused by what seasonal wind picking up sand from the Sahel and mixing it with moisture from the Mediterranean Sea? I need the name of the seasonal wind, which sounds similar to a popular hot sauce. All right. We just went the hot sauce angle because we don't know the name of the wind. And we said Tabasco. <laughs> we went with its its very known counterpart the sriracha <laughs> um spelled s-i-r-o-c-c-o -C -C no 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 <laughs> <laughs> sriracha or sriracha is uh i will give you credit for that wow <laughs> picked the wrong one yay <laughs> We got her the stupidest pick possible. A, pick a hot sauce, change one letter, and we picked wrong. <laughs> it could have been the tapatia. We had no idea. <laughs> tapatia. <laughs> All right. Going into question number four. In the category of water, uh, in the original Super Mario Brothers video game for the NES, there was a glitch in level 1-2 that allowed you to clip through the final exit pipe if you jumped correctly and got pulled through the wall to the warp pipes. If you entered one of those pipes after performing the glitch, you would be taken to an endless underwater level. What is this level or world better known as? And I'm looking for the number designation. We said, just on a guess, since it doesn't sound like it's an actual structured part of the game, 0-1. <clears throat> You guys are kind of close. I think um, it's generally referred to in the community as the minus world, but I think it says world negative one. It does say world negative one. There is no zero in front of it. It's just it's blank negative one. Mm -hmm. All right. Question five in the category of heart. The band heart was formed in 1970 in Seattle, Washington. They weren't always known by that name, though. They were originally the army and then White Hart, before dropping the white. At one point after Ann Wilson joined the band, they changed their name to what? Which might be confused with a 1993 Disney live-action flick about the Sanderson sisters. We said the Sanderson sisters are from Hocus Pocus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jill, you knew this one? Yeah, we got Hocus Pocus, too. You know, feeling a little witchy. <laughs> <laughs> witchy uh well good thing you did because it is in fact hocus pocus short-lived uh name change but i think you might have <laughs> beaten us by one sriracha <laughs> <laughs> after all is said and done if you are listening to the bodacious bass licks of verdine white of earth wind and fire fame you will uh dance to the final scores of 140 for keep the good times rolling and would be celebrating uh, the cream of the crop today with 205 points, the Fuji Laws. Oh my God, you guys, you're like the cream of the crop right now. Mm. <laughs> One sriracha Great away. Job. Yeah, we, we we just guessed the right hot sauce and changed the right vowel. <laughs> Had they not, the score would have been tied. You so, could have said and sriracha. We did not have a, uh, an extra plan, so. 
I'm sorry. I'm glad you they won. would have still won. It would have been 145 to 140. <laughs> Math Never mind. not our strong point unless it's Pythagorean theorems. <laughs> Great. I'm so mad about that. I'm so mad at myself. <laughs> Great game, Jeremy. Great uh, themes as well. I'm glad you guys let me come back and host again. We'll see how long it is before that happens again. <laughs> oh. You're always really welcome. Fun, Jeremy, thank you so much. Yeah, well, we're just excited you. to uh, see you in person. We, we normally see you out and about when we go play live pub trivia. So when that can happen again, it will be a, a joyous occasion. But uh, anyone you'd like to shout out or, or say hello to uh, for your last words here? Uh, yeah, thanks to, uh, like I mentioned, Aaron earlier, uh, Brittany Shaw, and uh, anybody else who helped me uh, play test this game or come up with some of the questions. Uh, also, shout out to my friends in the Quadrivia podcast which uh, Ken over there helps uh, edit every week. That is correct. And I was on an episode. As was I, I, I was also on I, an episode. Yeah. We need to get Jeff. everybody Jeff. on now? No, well, oh, Jeff, needs, Jeff? Jeff needs to be on one, and we have to get Jill on one as well. <laughs> there you go. I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. We got to have like a science-based one and get Jeff on, I think. I think as long as there's science and there's some maybe some snacks, I think he'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Jeremy, for uh, for being on the show. Everyone check out Quadrivia if you uh, want to hear more about the uh, inside uh, scoop on trivia. Uh, but a uh, big thank you to Jill. Uh, we loved seeing you, even though it wasn't in person. Hopefully it will be soon. But uh, anyone you'd like to shout out or where can people see your, your show that's coming out soon? You can find the Opus at consequenceofsound.com or subscribe to the Opus podcast everywhere. If you already listen to Triviality and Quadrivia, you know where podcasts live. We live there, too. And if you live in the uh, Chicago area, you can listen to Jill Afternoons every Monday through Friday from 1 to 5 on 91.1 FM. She just plays loops of all-star. Yep. The whole time. Like, somebody just every three and a half minutes. And then every once in a while, tub thumping, I believe. I heard earlier, right? <laughs> well, uh, that sounds like good radio, and we're happy to be a part of it over here at Triviality. But uh, for Jill, Jeremy, Matt, Jeff, Ken, and myself, my name is Neil, and that was Triviality. I think there's a Big Ben <laughs> diagram of Michiganders, and then Bob Euchre fans, and then there's all the big <laughs> Bob Euchre fans. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And that joke landed just a bit outside. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Great there save. <laughs>